This is the first episode of Relative Roads. This is a conversation with my good friend Josh. We've been friends for over 10 years. Josh and I started our friendship in a comedy troupe by the name of ICUP, I-C-U-P, one of the world's oldest jokes. Josh and I used to get together twice a week with uh, a number of other cast members. We'd write sketch comedy. We'd communicate through emails, text messages to develop this, these scenes that we would play on stage once, twice a month. Writing wasn't my strong point. However, Josh was an absolute pro, and uh, I gained a lot of respect for him and the way his mind works. But in this episode, we talk about a controversial post that Josh had placed on his Facebook. When I saw this post, I... Well, let's just say that the label of controversial is on me. I put that there, and I needed to talk about this moment with Josh. Because you see, I believe people get real upset about surface level things that are put on social media by their friends, their family, and acquaintances. And I personally wanted to clear up my own thought process with Josh and and put Josh back in a a good place in my heart where he belongs. And I did so uh, through this conversation. We talk about a number of things from our zodiac signs to the homeless problem in Sacramento and uh, some old relationships that we were kind of catching up on. I hope you enjoy the conversation. Thanks. Travel safe. Safe. Safe travels. Drive safe. Merge correctly. Merge like a pro. Enjoy the episode. I'm just a wandering nomad out on the interstate. One thing, right? The, yeah. And I did a, a minuscule amount of research. You're a Capricorn. I am, yeah. December 26th. December 26th. I'm, I, on a, I'm actually on a cusp. I'm on a Sagittarius Capricorn cusp. Oh, so see, my, I, sh- I wish I, sh- I would. So it's okay. It's my job to know this, not you. Okay, fair <laughs> enough. Well, okay. So the idea behind that is my own curiosity yeah. about how people feel about their Zodiac. I think Zodiac signs are bullshit. <laughs> you do? I do. I think, they're, I think they're kind of biblical in a way. That I think they're interesting. There's a foundational <laughs> bit of information that you can learn a lot about somebody on. However, you still have to get to know them uh, personally. Sure. I think because like uh, looking at your... Facebook feed, my his, my own history with you, knowing you. I'm Josh, by the way. Right. For those people who don't know who the fuck I this am. This is Joshua Dietz. Goes by Josh. <laughs> Whoa. All yeah. My, all my name. Uh, congratulations. Uh, Social security number is. <laughs> I'll give you that on the yeah. uh, on That'll the That'll be in the below. credits. Yeah. Yeah. yeah you link. can find that in the description below. <laughs> uh, what if I turn my phone horizontal, though? There's no description below. So what do I do then? I don't know. Oh, okay. Borrow a friend's computer. All right. Uh Oh, there it goes. <laughs> there goes that thought. No. Okay. So, yeah. All right. I'm Zodiac just going to start there. I, I started doing a little research on Capricorns. My father's a Capricorn. The basis of what I understand is that you have a hard time saying no to many projects. You uh, you spread yourself pretty thin a lot of times. Mm-hmm. Uh, you're pretty grounded in how you think things are in the world. Uh, can be fairly stubborn about things. That's an accurate. <laughs> that's an act. Yeah, most Capricorns that you meet in this world, uh, there's two constants with them. One is um, they're like workaholics. Yeah. They uh, right. You know, they work, 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 go, 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 money, money, money. Right. right. That's their. That's their yes. thing. And then the other thing is, is that they're um, like emotionally stunted. Like they don't really know how to like um, because they're so focused on like. Sure, that makes my dad's that very way. Uh, you know, like like. Uh, they're so grounded and like the, the, I wake up, I brush my teeth, I drink my coffee, then I take a shower, then structure. I get dressed structure. And then, so a lot of times it leaves them emotionally stunted. That's why I think for me, 
like adhering s- strictly to this um oh your zodiac sign dictates your characteristics or your, your character traits or whatever i find it to be bullshit simply because i don't i'm i'm i mean you know me you've known me for many years now like i'm i'm, I'm definitely not emotionally stunted you know? no like, well that's what i'm saying there's an exception to the stuff that the zodiac says yeah, right absolutely there absolutely. are <clears throat> people are different you're allowed to have your experience in this reality you're allowed to be you like, well precisely <laughs> and but i think that there is a universal yeah. connection with people that are born in certain months oh sorry uh So I think that, yeah, like I said, I think there's a universal connection with people who are (coughs) born at certain times. Uh, You know, the... And what's your sign, Mike? What are you? Cancer. My mom's a cancer. Her birthday's a couple weeks from now. We're very sensitive. Super. The the thing I... But but sensitive in ways... Like, I know I just called it bullshit and I'm like agreeing with him. (laughs) Uh, Sensitive in ways that you wouldn't think, though. Like, my mom is sensitive... Um, she's very in touch with her own feelings, but then she's also in touch with everyone's yes. feelings around. So her. that's what I was going to say is that my weakness is my strength. Yeah. Essentially. Because your empathy cancer. can be your. Right. You, you're you like a, a cancer sniffing dog in that's a lot a of ways. That's a weird pun to make, but go for it. Sure. Well, I mean, it's. Uh, yeah. Uh, Get it because your sign is cancer. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's what I'm a cancer survivor. You should have said a crab sniffing dog. <laughs> Or that, yeah. but then that gets sexual, and I don't yeah. want to mm. have crabs. Do you hear um, about that guy who went down on that girl in Thailand and got crabs in his eyebrows? No. Yeah, it happened. Really? Yeah. That's a real story? Yeah, it's a real story. Well, okay, if we're off on a tangent, <laughs> did you hear about the guy here locally who was on meth and in the parking lot of, I think, Safeway at, at Alhambra, uh, oh, trying to fight everybody? Yeah, I heard that there was a... Um, Living in the city of downtown Sacramento, uh, which is a different city of Sacramento. It's like there's New York, New York, and then there's New York. Right. Uh, so downtown Sac has its own interesting conundrums. Uh, and one of them is uh, bath salts and meth are really big in the town right now. And um, yeah. it's yeah, yeah it's, it's unfortunate. But um, yeah, he was uh, he, he first and foremost, he was a schizophrenic who was also elevated on meth. So, sure. like, let's not forget that like. There was some mental issues going on there as well. Yeah. And um, I do want to thank, because you are going to want to bring this up later. I do want to thank the city of Sacramento <laughs> for not shooting him first. <laughs> you know, when the police showed up, they didn't just go, okay, die, black sure. guy on meth. You know, they, they talked him down. They got him in. Uh, help you know and, and well they they ended up stunning him. They did. You, well, you have to. You but here, what but it's was- non-lethal. Well, fine, but what, well, they did damage him. So here's what happened. The the ultimate outcome was he just got five point two million dollars from the city. He did because of his being tased. Yeah, because of the Skin the damage, damage done yeah. by the tase. Or right. so, which is weird, right? It's like, a, like, yeah, like, like that's how you like, make a million bucks. Well, no, what's yes, <laughs> yeah, it's insurance money. Um, yeah. What's what's weird about it is, is that here here we are talking about in the same sentence. We're like, thank you for not killing him. But now the city of Sacramento is five thousand five million dollars in debt because they didn't kill him. Well, yes. But OK, like, so do you know how much a wrongful death suit pays out versus I have no idea. We're talking millions of dollars in differences here. A wrongful death suit. Like if, if this family of this man would have sued the city because of like he was shot and killed. They would have paid like one or two million dollars. Sure. In a injury, right? The sky's the limit. Yeah. How much were your medical bills? That's where we're starting. Yeah. You know, like, and then how much did it cost the police to, to or like, what was the manpower involved? Like, boom, there's that tacked on. And yeah. you just keep going, you keep going. The sky's the limit. So it almost seems like there's an incentive to like, to kill people versus, <laughs> versus, <laughs> you know, stunning them. Okay. That's yeah. That's one take on it. I mean, it. if you're if you're talking fiscal conservative. <laughs> well, my my thought process is, what's the alternative in solving that problem? I don't know, you man. Sh- we were talking about zodiac signs. <laughs> well, okay, but but I want to finish this this uh, topic here. Okay, so so the the cops show up. This guy's trying to fight everybody, including them. Yeah. They he becomes well, he becomes what's known as a public hazard. He's sure. A hazard unto himself and others. Right, and and they. Obviously, shooting, uh, you know, suspects is is kind of a thing right now. They don't want to do it's, that. Well, I don't want to say. I think you should rephrase that and say it's not a thing right now. It's a thing. End of sentence. Okay. Well, fine. So, but th- uh, let's say we can commend them for not shooting them, like you just said. Mm-hmm. However, what's the other alternative? How do they take this guy? Well, How do they take the hazard? That is the conundrum in which we live, right? Right. Like, when I take the stance of saying like. 
fuck the police. Yeah. What people read is a baseline, um, you know, like judging a book by its cover. They, they're reading one sentence. What they're not doing is looking into the systematic um, issues that exist within a police force. Like, first and foremost. Sure. Right? Like, as a society, we need laws and yes. we need structure because if we don't have that, mm -hmm. then it's anarchy. And right? we need police. And, I mean... This is essentially what you're getting Yes. At. We need we need okay. a we need a presence to constantly remind us, hey... Stay, you know, don't fucking color outside the lines. Don't head. lose your shit. Don't lose your shit. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and yes. if you do, we have these really nice hotels for you <laughs> with a really comfortable bed and some meals. And then you get out after you thought about what you did. Yeah. Um, you know, and I think that that's important. You know, you can't go around murdering people without consequences. Um, so that in and of itself is fine. Like as a society, you need that. Um, where we start to get into some trouble are these gray areas where you have individuals, male and female, going into the police force. First of all, you're calling it a force. So by calling it that, you're 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 you're, uh, you're militarizing it. You, well, you're placing an identity on it that makes it sound altruistic in what it does. Right? There's a, sort of a clandestine this word feeling to the word force right you know force is a, a very um pow powerful word it, i mean it means something of we hear the word force mm -hmm. we don't need that defined for us we know what that carries emotionally and literally when we talk about that word so calling it a police force i think is <clears throat> is not a good thing either but then what do you want to call it? The police squad oh, squad sounds like a bunch of boy scouts are going to show up and sell you cookies. Right. Okay. Like, so, you know, you have to find this balance. I'm not saying I have the answers, right? I, here's what I'm saying is I'm noticing that there is, it has been broken for a long time. Sure. And I'm noticing that nobody wants to do anything about it. So I'm voicing my displeasure, right? Sure. Nobody has an issue with somebody going on Yelp and saying this restaurant sucked one star. Yep. Let me tell you why. Okay. We all just go, oh, cool. I have to avoid that taco stand or I have to avoid, uh, you know, that Italian restaurant or I have it, it, we, we understand that and we, we just accept it. But then when we become critical of our institutions, suddenly you've crossed the line. No, no, no. But OK, so uh, let me ask you a question. Uh, going back to the Facebook post that you that you had put on that is absolutely 100 percent. Fuck the police. That's yes. the Facebook. Quote OK, line. right. And so and I and. When I saw, I'm, I speak from my experience when I saw that, which now was your experience with your own life or with me? No, with you in okay. that moment, because you obviously put that there for your own reason. And yep. and me personally, I like to ask questions before I throw stones. I'm not going to say, well, that's an ignorant thing to do. And mm -hmm. <clears throat> mind you, that does cross my mind when I see stuff. Sure, you go human. through, you filter yeah, through yeah. all the thoughts and, and things like the yeah, pre your, your process. Yeah. But I realized that there's something to that, that deserves some investigative outlook and and that's Fair. all i'm trying to do is understand where so when you post something like that when because as somebody who has an influence on other people in your feed mm -hmm. what are you trying to accomplish with that statement 100 percent, absolutely fuck the police well there's so there's the catharsism of doing it right so there's a selfish. There's always everything. You, everything you do on social media is a selfish indulgence. Fair everything. enough. Everything. Okay. Um, d let, let's let's call that for what it is. Right. Like we go on we go on our Facebook feeds, we go on our Twitter feeds, our Instagram feeds, for for two reasons. One is our selfish need to belong. Sure. If we go on these things, there's we select who follows us. We select who we follow. We select, we, we filter our feeds. So we look at the things that only derive dopamine responses within our brains. And it is 100% a selfish act to even have an account on social media. So then you add on to that, right? I'm going to go in there and I'm going to post shit too. I'm going to, sure. I'm going to make my voice heard. That's a selfish act. Of course. So everything you do is a selfish act. 100% went on social media. So number one is, it was a selfish act. Okay. There was catharsis, um, or catharsis rather in, uh, posting that by, by, by saying in that moment, exactly how I felt and putting that out for the, there for the world and fuck the consequences. I don't care who gets offended. I don't care who likes it. That's how I feel right now you do that and then you move on right mm -hmm. and then you check it again 
And then suddenly there's responses. Ooh, so the dopamine levels have rise have risen now. People saw what I said. You I've know? been heard. I've been heard. I stood on my soapbox in the middle of Times Square and I yelled some shit and people are standing here listening now. You know, like, I mean, like, uh, so. So it's a need for attention. So there's, there's a need for attention. The bottom line. Okay. Um, if you, if you go on my Facebook feed and you actually look at how many times I comment and how many times I'm interactive with the posts that I make, you'll be very surprised to hear and to see that like I could give a fuck. I, uh, understand social media for what it is and what it is, is a, is a, uh, self derived, uh, you know, like pleasure button. And I choose, and we'll get to how I figured this out. I choose how I push that button. And, um, I love my wife to death. <laughs> She's way more addicted to this thing than I am. Um, and so that even the, uh, being, I being notified that I offended somebody, my phone does not tell me that my phone doesn't go. You have a notification on Facebook. I don't even have the app installed. I go on my web browser and I use it through the web browser and then it's really easy to ignore. Um, and, uh, the web browser on my 45, I use Chrome, um, Google fucking Chrome. Thanks Google. Uh, so the, uh, if I say 34, I say, I say 45 and I'm 34. It's like, I'm figuring out that far off dickhead. Uh, uh, so, you know, my wife, she goes like, Hey, you should go on and read this post that you, you should go look at the comments. Like you really pissed off so-and-so or so-and-so looks like their feelings got hurt. Now here's what's funny. One of the commenters on that post is a cop. Okay. She works out in West Sacramento. Um, I think I know what the, the comment. I'm not going to put her name out there. No, just, no, no. But I, I think it was, there's got to be some good ones out there. Is that kind of what she said? Uh, <clears throat> sure. We'll stay in that. I don't want to quote her directly because sure. I don't want to blow her spot up. Right. Even saying what I just said, even identifying her gender, which I shouldn't have done either. Uh, it's in the can now. Uh, yeah, it's in the can now. Um, you know, anyway. Okay, yeah, carry on. Um. So you pissed she, off somebody. She is, I did. I offended her deeply. Okay. Um, she is a police officer. She is one of the good ones. Um, and I hate even, say, I, I, it really bothers me to even say that verbiage because it, I shouldn't have to clarify. I should just say she's a police officer and you should automatically know that she's a good person. You should automatically know that she's a, like a trustworthy individual. And, and it, anyway, uh, she commented you know what she commented and I didn't see it. And my wife says, Hey, you should go look at this. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I said, okay. So I went and looked and I'm like, Oh man, that's not somebody I wanted to make mad. That's not even, you weren't even in my thought process when I, when I felt this, when I said what I said, you know? So I reached out and I said, Hey dude, I'm uh, really sorry if I offended you. Um, I literally did say, Hey dude, <laughs> sure. Uh, cause it's California and I say dude to everybody. Right said, hey, dude, I'm really sorry if I offended you. Let me explain my thought process here. And I, ex- I gave her the explanation. I told her what I was feeling, why I was feeling it, the situation that I had witnessed that made me feel that way, and um, that I recognize the good and hard work that she does. You know, Police officers do a job. They work crazy long hours, and they come into a community where – and let's 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 play softball here. Ninety percent of them don't want to fucking deal with them. Mm-hmm. You know, we are been conditioned now as a society that when we see the police officers, we don't think of it as like, oh, here comes Dale, our local police officer. Mm-hmm. What's Dale up to? Let's go talk to Dale. We don't view it like that. We go, oh, somebody's in trouble. You see Somebody. the force, right? You see, you see this. You feel the you force. feel the force, <laughs> right? You feel this. Pol- you feel this police presence, you know, <laughs> it's like, it's you like feel it's, Darth Vader. In right. This. It's like the neighborhood got fucking possessed and, and there's, you know, it's like, Oh shit, somebody's getting right. Cut, somebody's getting clapped up, you know, like, so we, y- you do a really thankless job. You work these crazy mm-hmm. long hours. You yeah. literally are putting your life on the line every day, every day. Every you have no day. idea that, that traffic stop on. could be your last yes. traffic stop. That, so scary. Yeah, it's very scary. Mm-hmm. And I'm not unrecognizable of that. I'm just not. And I, and I think it would be a naive, I think it was sexy. It's way to drink that water in that microphone. Well, I was trying to <laughs> drink quietly, but you see what my straw sounds like. That was anticlimactic. Okay. Wait, hold on. So let me, I want to, to get to more understanding of this. I want to know why you posted that. What made So you... I work in Roseville, California 
and um, Roseville, California, for those of you who don't know, is a very, very rich area, rich in money and rich in, in people. Mm-hmm. And um, uh, some might say bougie. <laughs> um, in some parts, yes. yeah. Um, Granite Bay, very much so. Right, and where I work is 10 minutes from Granite Bay. I work um, uh, for a company that's off of Galleria Boulevard. That's, um, oh, it's this part that's limp dick. Let me fix that. <laughs> I was like, why is that sinking? Um, so uh, I, I work in this really bougie part of Roseville. And um, uh, the police are very forceful in their, uh, how they deal with the homeless population in, um, in Roseville. Um, they, you know, it's, they, they, tre- they treat the homeless population in Roseville like a garbage man does on garbage day for, you know, picking mm-hmm. up your trash cans. It's like, right. pick them up, throw them in, take them somewhere else. Sure. And, um, I just, I, so I, you know, to set this up, uh, going into this, I was coming out of work and I was going to my car when I witnessed all of this. I don't know what happened beforehand. I don't know what happened afterhand. All I know is what I saw. And um, now that doesn't mean that's like one day, one day I woke up and I was like, the police are great. And when I saw this thing, I'm like, well, fuck them. You know, like there's a lifetime of stuff. But okay. in this particular moment, um, this is what I saw. A gentleman, uh, African-American descent, um, no shoes, really raggedy jeans, really raggedy shirt, um, a really unkempt, obviously homeless, um, was walking uh, through the parking lot. And then suddenly three squad cars, one in front of him and two behind him, just like they were in, a, in the middle of, you know, a police drama, sc- come scritching in and six dudes all white, jump out of their cars, all guns are drawn. So this one guy with no shoes now has six white men, six guns, and three squad cars on top of him. Now, obviously, we are all educated people. You don't get that kind of response unless you done did something really fucked up. And again, I say, I don't know what this man did. I don't have an explanation. I have no fucking clue. I don't know if there was a violent altercation, if he robbed somebody, if he tried to rob somebody, if he went into like a diamond store and smashed a case. Like I don't know. What I know is, is that the response was a lot. Overkill in your eyes. In, in, in my eyes, yes. But what do I know? Sure. You know, um, so they yell at him, you know, get on the fucking ground, put your fucking hands up, get on the ground. It's like you're yelling all kinds of different commands at the same time. So that's confusing, you mm-hmm. know. So he's like he's he's got like one hand up. And he's like trying to get on the ground with his other hand, but he doesn't really know what to do. And uh, and so finally he just like fuck it. And he just puts his hands up and drops to his knees and gets flat on his face. And this is it was one hundred and six outside that mm-hmm. day. And uh, he was getting on a asphalt surface in the middle of a parking lot uh and they immediately jumped on top of him you know smashed him into the ground handcuffed him he's yelling and screaming about his face is burning and stuff and they're telling him to shut the fuck up and they had the knee in the back of the neck and all this stuff and i don't say anything i know better of course (laughs) again lifetime of shit i've seen sure um but i'm but I'm overly angry that I am helpless in by my bystander. Sure. Uh, and uh, I'm just standing there observing this. And that that sensation is my overriding like anger response of where I'm like, I'm Captain save a and I must rescue all the people. And that's not my job. I'm like, I didn't, you know, like I didn't um, sign up to, to do that. But like, there's this overriding sense that I have to do that. Like happens. <clears throat> Excuse me. And, um, they, he gets thrown in a squad car and they all sort of congratulate each other and we're like, good job, buddy. <laughs> you know, yeah. Way to go us. We got the perp. <laughs> yeah. We got him. Let's go. You know, burn. And take off, you know? And, yeah. um, <clears throat> and yeah, I mean, he wasn't shot and killed or anything like that. He, he, he was very cooperative as he could be, you right. know? And as you uh, must as, yeah. I mean, you have six guns pointed at you. You have to just go with it until I mean like like I'm 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 glad that that day I didn't see someone get gunned down. Yeah. Am I can I say that I haven't seen it? No, I can't say that sure. cuz I have. I've witnessed it. Sure. Um 
so I had this overriding sense of anger of just like, I am so frustrated right now with constantly seeing this image of these powerful white men oppressing someone of color. And that's a white guy telling you that. Mm-hmm. That isn't my white guilt. You're just tired of that. I'm just image. tired of that image because, because, and this is my selfishism again. Um, it sucks having to walk around and that being the immediate judgment of you. Like you, like, like if you and I, like, you know, you're, you're, uh, have you're ethnically ambiguous. We'll say. Sure. People say like, is he Mexican? Is he Filipino? Right. You know, like, what I'm a it? guessing game. Yeah, he's a, <laughs> could you guess who? <laughs> Yeah. Um, And, uh, you know, where was I going with that thought? I don't remember. Us walking around. Oh, us walking around. Mm -hmm. People would automatically assume that you made less money than me. They would just automatically assume that. Some of them. Some of them. I mean, that's what I mean. I don't mean the general popular. I mean, like, there's there's few people. There are folks out Um, there. Yes. And they would, you know, and they'd say, like, oh, how nice of that white man. You know, like <laughs> to be friends. Yes. Such a low quality <laughs> individual. He must have a heart of gold. <laughs> what a lucky brown guy. I tell you, these slaves these days got it easy. Well, can I give you my take on your experience? Sure. Your description Please. of your experience. I find it admirable and very honorable that you felt so much compassion, so much so that you were overwhelmed with it. But also that you're able to rear back and see both sides. I and, think I think you have to. I think. And, and and that's the important part here, because I think what happens, and this is what sparked the idea for this podcast, is that people will distance themselves from each other mm. with this finite belief on on people based on their social media mm-hmm. or based on their brief interaction with someone. One hundred percent. They make a statement like "fuck the police." Well. That's just a feeling. Right. In essence, what you did was post a feeling based on what you just experienced. You weren't saying permanently. Oh, I, no, I, I, I should clarify. I posted that about five and a half hours after that happened. Well, it's still relative. It's the same day. Well, it's, be, it's the same day. And, that's and a, then be- an right before to... I posted it, I was shown the video of the Arizona incident that happened the same day or the day before what I experienced. Okay. Um, and for Which those of you who another, don't, if ahead. those of you who don't know the Arizona video that I'm referring to, a uh, mother, uh, a, a African American descended uh, mother and her child were coming back from I think like a 99 cent store, or Dollar General, or something like that, <clears throat> and um, the 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 child, child stole, stole like mm-hmm. a doll. I, yeah, um, saw that today actually. Right, and um, the I, I, either the mother knew or she didn't know, but. Uh, regardless of what it was, none of us were in the store. None of us were in that woman's head. None of us saw like if their security camera, like we don't know them if there was maliciousness behind it, or what they were told before what they, they were got told. There. Right. Like none of us know anything. We just know what we saw from the Correct. video. Right. Yeah. So what were the cops told? Right. right. Well, why, why? Like, so basically for those who haven't seen it and you should go watch it um, and you should feel outraged from it. Um, or, or not, in which case you don't have a soul. Uh, whatever, it's your life. But you should acknowledge that there are there layers. There was something wrong there. You should just acknowledge, just watch it and acknowledge there was something wrong there. Just like just like you should you should acknowledge that walking yes. into someone else's house in the middle of Houston, Texas, and then shooting the person who lives there and claiming, oh, I was confused. I thought this was my place. Yeah. And I'm a cop, by the way. Just, you know, there's something wrong there. Yes. And to not be able to, to say that or to see that, that's where I draw a really big line in the sand and say, if you're on uncap- if you're incapable rather of seeing the, I don't, just the pure wrongness of it, then I don't want to have anything to do with you because we're just not going to fundamentally have anything in common. You know? Well, I think where it starts is, is this well, having the cops drew down on this woman, by the way. And right. Like, I saw that. It's, I, it's I saw thing. everything. And and he's and yelling and screaming at her saying, well, we told you to put your hands up. I was like, well, hold my fucking kid. And you have guns pointed at me. I don't want to move. But what I'm what I'm experiencing in all of these these same instances with you, what I see in the media, uh, 
you know, seeing the homeless, you know, at, at where I used to work, it's it's B Street in Sacramento. It's oh, yeah. all homeless out it's the there. Levy, so yeah. And you see them get get sweeped into a van and shipped out. Who knows where they go? Well, what they they is <laughs> actually a common. Uh, it started in New York City and it's spread out through the entire country. And they actually do it in other countries, too. Um, it's tra- all you're doing is is you're, you're just sweeping it under the rug. Right. Mm-hmm. So it's like. All right. Well, what street are we sweeping today? Right. They're actually the units are called street sweepers, and um, that's the loose. That's the the the, the nickname for it. The jargon. The jargon. Okay. Um, and they uh, they go around and they they have paddy wagon vans. Right. They can fit up like twenty people in them, and they just go swoop, swoop them up. Yeah. Okay. You don't live here anymore. You now live in Citrus Heights, or sure. you now live in, uh, you know, West Sacramento, or you're over here in Del, Del Paso, now. and and and. and uh, and it's a and it and then they they go back to their bosses. And goes well, you know we cleaned up B Street today. We got rid of forty five of them motherfuckers. So we're <laughs> we're cleaning up. We cleaned up B Street real good. And and you just have to sit there and and hope <sighs> that they're not being they're completely being, mistreated. But you're right, you just have so to. I I, I want to stay on the subject, but I, you know that I I tried to get in with the police department. I recently. do, I do, I do. Um, I actually never had one of them call me and ask me about you. Well, that's because it all. It just didn't happen, okay. and uh, some different reasons. I have different theories on why, but ultimately, can I, I a, can I say something before you continue? Sure. When you told me that, and you told me that they were, you know, oh, they're going to call and screen. I was really happy for you. I was um, fair enough. Um, I uh, uh, just let this be understood. Um, I wanted to be a cop when I was a kid. Sure. Um, I, I wanted to be a cop all the way up until my first incidents when I saw the abuse of power. That's when I stopped wanting to be a cop. I was about 14 or 15. And um, uh, I have, ooh, fire truck. <laughs> They're coming for us. Um, right. <laughs> why is a fire truck hitting a fire truck? Um, it's going to get very loud, by the way. My windows are open, and it's going to get very loud. Well, it is a very hot topic. So. Um, <laughs> uh, sponsored this week by Hot Topic. <laughs> um, so I have I, I was very happy for you. I was happy for you for a multitude of reasons. One, I was happy that you're going to get some stability. Um, I was very, very excited for that. I was also happy that you had shared with me this want and this desire to go do a thing and that you trusted me enough to vouch for you. So I was very excited and happy for all these things. Um, but at the same time, very terrified. Sure. Most people were very, you know, but I don't. But most people will tell you that I'll just go. You do you boo right well the reason one of the reasons why i sought after you as a reference you're an honest guy trying try to, to do try the to right be, thing try to do trying it. to live right you know that's just trying i know who you are right and i know that you'll represent me well right um <laughs> mike haley's a fucking asshole <laughs> he fucking cut me off in traffic one time i don't know why he gave you my number that's why they didn't pick me right. uh no, my knee's bad, and and I didn't participate in like their weekly boot camp thing. And oh, yeah, I, I was told, "Go show your face, yeah, get to you know the cops." Yeah. And I didn't do it because yeah. of my knee, and it didn't work out. But I want to get to the reason why I felt obliged to even try. Mm. A lot like yourself, witnessing the world as it is and seeing things the way they are in the government, in our policing specifically, I get angry too. I get emotional wondering, like, is this just going to get worse? Right. You know? well, how is this but normalized? The thing is, coming from an experience in leadership that I had recently had over the last couple of years, understanding the the importance of leadership in the community as a style of personality, as mm-hmm. a way of living, mm-hmm. understanding what that means to the community, to any community, the one you're directly involved with, the one that is on the outskirts of your community, the qualities of leadership are so important and not from a positional standpoint, not from a status level of police officer or the, the way I saw it though, is police officers are a, are a representation of, of people in the community who want to be the example. Yeah. And instead of me throwing stones and looking at the cops as, as a fucked up situation, my idea was to get involved, understand what they're working with and try to work uh, try to make a change within that was yeah. my goal and and it's it still is it, uh, spiritually i want to be involved the reason for this podcast is i'm a grown-up man i want to talk about shit yeah. I, i'm tired of 
being in passing with people and and you know and i do this around it and i'm human too and i'll put walls up and i'll look at people like i don't want to talk to them we all do it right but the goal is to to change that and the only way to change the world is to work on me Mm. and to be consistent because i got a kid i'm not he's not going to be perfect he's going to be who he is but if he can at least he's a great kid, if though. he can reference his dad in terms of maturity in terms of relationships how i conducted well, I think, myself i think too just focus on just being a, a good human exactly being a good human to other humans yes and communicating well i mean which i struggle with <laughs> very well, we, i'm a talker but i don't communicate for shit but how know? many opportunities do you give yourself to actually work through shit i mean therapy is one of those things you don't really think about till you have a problem right and but, then you think well i don't need a therapist i can just i'll just i know what the issue is and i'll work on it. sure but no you know i mean but like it, it it's a, it's the idea of expressing what's going on inside you. And a lot of times we don't trust other people to hear that yeah. information. But the truth is we, we have, we have the resources to be there for each other. Mm. We just have to exercise that activity. You know what I mean? I do. And I think, I think, you know, you hit something very, um, touched on something rather that was very, that's important as a leadership in a community. Yes. You're the kind of guy that if the shit went down right now, you would have no problem saying, Mike, let's go. I know where to go. And you would take me anywhere it took to get to safety. Yeah, of course. And I could trust you. That's what I'm saying. And I think I'm pretty similar in that way. I'd be I scared actually, of crying. I, I actually but... was, um, you're scared of crying? No, I'd be scared and crying. Oh, because like I'm a cancer. It's like, oh, and there it is for a circle. All right. Thanks for listening to our first episode. <laughs> um, no, it, uh, uh, yeah, I mean, I actually was told one time, um, in a year in a year review an employee year review Mm. that my biggest character flaw is that i put others before me and um i was like wow like that's such a weird thing to hear right um and again it goes to my it goes to my mother and my father and our upbringing um we we a lot of misfortune in my uh growing up there was so much uh missed opportunity there was so much um robbing Peter to pay Paul type stuff. And, um, that's a Bible reference by the way. Yes. Uh, um, and, uh, just, you know, just my mother and my father having, um, a lifetime of baggage that bringing into their relationship. Um, you know, just a lot of things. And so for a small portion of my life, um, as a young human, um, I was homeless with my family. Uh, so my older brother, my younger brother, my sister had moved away by that point. She's the oldest of all of us. Um, she had, she had moved away by that point. It was actually estranged at that time too. She was actually very, um, on the outside of the family looking in. And, um, I, for reasons I, to this day, I still don't understand, but whatever, <laughs> that's my mom and my dad and her got to figure that out. Like I've always been tight with my sister. So, um, but, uh, yeah, I mean, I remember we woke up one morning it was Christmas Eve, uh, 1996, and <laughs> one morning, like I didn't remember the date exactly. Um, uh, Christmas morning, 1996, um, Christmas Eve morning, rather. We um, wake up to four sheriffs, or one sheriff and three deputies, um, in our living room, serving a 24-hour get the fuck out notice to my parents um, in this house, that, in this apartment, rather Eve. that we were living in. Christmas Eve. Uh, they weren't happy. They had to serve it. They, you know, they were very upset that, um, they did, they, you know, they said over and over, we did everything we could, you know, ma'am, my mom's crying, you know, has her hand, head in her hands. She's bawling. My dad's trying to, you know, he's doing the, he's pleading, you know, he's, he's, he's sure. trying to wheel and deal. He's trying to make it, you know, Hey, it's, you know, Christmas is tomorrow. My son's birthday is the day after that. You know, like, is there anything we can do? Blah, blah, blah. You know, no. Right. This is the end of it. Yeah. Have a good life. You need, you have to be out tomorrow. Like we will come and if you don't, if you didn't leave it, if you, if you left it in here, it belongs to the owner, you know? And it's like, okay. So, uh, my dad got a U-Haul. Um, we moved into a U-Haul. <laughs> um, then we had that U-Haul towed with a bunch of stuff in it. Cause he didn't pay. Um, cause he, you know, and he, at the time we had, um, 
a little Subaru station wagon that he had bought used and was he had a he had a he had a 80 something Chevy Malibu right before that and was constantly working on it and then we had this little station wagon he was constantly working on that you know it it never ran right it was constantly being tweaked and I'm in middle school seventh grader in middle school Mm. um after the after the the U-Haul got towed um, all I had was a couple pairs of underwear, a pair of sweatpants, my shoes, my socks. I was wearing that day, a, a t-shirt and a hoodie. That's it. And that's it. Going to middle school, wearing the same, same clothes every day. And, um, my mother was, a, is still a smoker, you know, packing a half a day smoker. Yeah. And, um, so then you smell like cigarettes on top of that. Sure. You know, and then you don't wash your clothes regularly. So it's rough. Yeah. It's real rough being, uh, so and this was when I started to see the police brutality thing, you know, cause you grew up homeless, you see shit. I watched a, uh, elderly black guy, um, who had befriended us living out of this car. Um, I should also state too, that my parents did something that I don't think many homeless people did or do now, which is they relied on a friend. So we stayed at a friend's house for a, a long chunks of this too. So I, I, you know, to say that I was living in a car the whole time would be an incorrect statement. There was times where we were living in um, an actual house, but it was me and my brothers sleeping in sleeping bags on a floor in a corner of a, of a friend's house. Still homeless, just not your home. Right, exactly. Anyway, I watched this guy get gunned down um, by the police, and. Um, the lack of give a shit that these dudes had for taking a human life was unreal to me. Mm. And I was just like, well, I'm going to rethink my life goals, you know? Sure. And, um, discovered comedy around. You were in same seventh time. grade, seventh grade. Yeah. It was in com. I discovered comedy around the same time. Discovered that I like to make people laugh. I uh, found it, um, you know, some sort of something therapeutic about it. Of course. You yes. know? Um, and, and then, uh, got made fun of for being homeless and beat the shit out of a kid and got expelled. So, wow. um, I was a bad student going up to all that. And anyway, again, lifetime of choices make you who you are today. It's just mm-hmm. learning from those choices that doesn't make you an asshole. So, um, so yeah, we, um, uh, growing up homeless and all that, I have a unique perspective when it comes to viewing and talking to other homeless people. There's a guy out over here on, um, if you come into downtown Sacramento from the freeway, there's a guy over here on the corner of 16th street and, um, uh, W, uh, he stands right there on the exit mm. and he, um, he has a sign that says, bet you can't hit me with a dollar. I've seen this person. And, uh, you look at him and you're like, fuck that guy. He's not homeless. Mm-hmm. You know? Well, have you had a conversation with the man? He is homeless through and through. Um, but he's also homeless, uh, not by choice. He, uh, uh, again, a lifetime of situations got him to a place where he thought he was set for life, bought a house, did all these things, yada, yada, yada. Well, housing market did what it did. He's homeless and nobody will hire him. He's, he has, he, he is, his skills are outdated enough now in the tech community that like he needs to go and constantly like, you know, have to relearn stuff. And, um, you know, he knows how to code, but he doesn't know like what these new kids know and, or how to do these shortcutty things. He's, uh, so he's not the skills that he relied on to get to where he was. He just aren't there anymore. Right. So now, he, so now he looks like he belongs in like a stoner metal band with funny signs to get money because he's figured that's what works for him. Sure. And he takes care of his shit. You know, he, he uses his money wisely. He goes and buys food for himself. He washes his clothes at the laundromat. And what he has is he cares about deeply because it's his, it's all he has. But you snap judgment on that guy. The moment you see him, you're fucking Do you never do that? I mean, snap judgments. Yeah. Oh, everybody does. But I mean, with homeless, is that I try. Something? I really try not to. I really, honestly, try not to. Do you ever give uh, money to homeless? If I have it. If you have it. Yeah. Um, do you think that this gentleman that you're speaking of? Do you think that there may be more happening than you're aware of? Of course, okay. he's only telling me. You know, um, he. So, uh, the the reason I ask is. 
uh, maybe not all of us, but I personally have experienced forks in the road where you you make a pretty pivotal choice, and that can either you can either end up on the street, right, or you end up building your life from the bottom. Oh, I've, and I think we've all made the choice where we it crumbles underneath right. us at some point or another. And I understand. You know, I moved to L.A. For a little while, yeah, it was a horrible choice. <laughs> sure, <laughs> it was sure. a horrible choice. And luckily, you have family and resources, and, and I was able to bounce will... back. Sure, right, and but that's not everybody what I has that. rely on exactly. Yeah. So I can appreciate that aspect as well of homelessness and how that might throw a God, real I big wrench. LA. Um, most people do. That's it is kind awful. of awful. Um, but the idea, obviously, there's so many sides to to a coin, um, especially when we're talking about homeless situations. Mm. I, it's, okay, in, in every issue in society, I think, starts with mental health. The police department, uh-huh. mental health. The homelessness, mental health. Uh, politics, mental health. Everything is mental health. So I feel that there should be a, a, a high focus on, I don't know, call it like a hippie-esque sort of approach. But we really need to pay closer attention to each other and and find ways to support one another, be innovative, be creative. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, it has to happen. It's not a new idea that you're saying. No, and I, I realize. No, that. no, I'm, I'm, I'm not shitting. I'm like, fuck you, come up with something cool. Yeah. I'm not, I'm just, what I'm saying is, is it's not, you know, it's not like you say, like, guys, look at that stone. It's a square. But if we rounded it, <laughs> yeah. we could roll it easier. Yeah, you, know, yeah. so you didn't just invent the wheel. Sure. But what I'm saying is, you can draw a line to where we're at now in society to where we came from in terms of mental health. You remember back in the day when guys would come, I don't know you would remember you weren't around, but you remember reading about when guys would come um, from back from World War One and they would be fucking, you know, just all like, yeah. um, just, it, we called it shell shock. We didn't realize that that was actually post-traumatic stress syndrome, mm-hmm. you know, where you had such an emotional scar and such a vivid mental, you know, just wound happen to you that you're reliving it so much that it's actually causing phys- it's manifesting as physical ailment. Mm-hmm. Oh, this, <laughs> he heard too many fucking shells go off in world war one. Yeah. So too loud. Like, it was too loud. Was Turn too, the TV down. Yeah, tell him to put you're some freaking airplane. them out. <laughs> it's fucked up, right? Sure, yeah. We yeah. just didn't understand it, but right. now over the course of years, we're going like, oh no, that's like a legitimate thing. That's a legitimate, you know, it's a, it's, yeah. it's a they don't call it a disease, a, an ailment. Mm-hmm. Um, and um, or it might be it might be classified as a disease now. I can't remember, but um, no, it's a disorder. It's not a disease. It's in the title. Duh. Um, it's classified as a mental health problem, um, but it is an environmental uh, caused problem. And PTSD isn't just veterans. PTSD isn't just right. battered housewomen. It mm-hmm. isn't just um, ugh, rape victims. I actually hate saying that word. Um, it just what, it, more rape. Rape, yeah. It's very just it, the whole thing's uncomfortable. Um, sure. Uh, so we have to think about the brain as a computer. If you log on to your computer right now when you go to a porn site and you don't turn on any of your antivirus software, your computer's going to walk away and go like, well, I don't know what the fuck just happened, but yeah. things are messed up now. And like, I don't know how to fix it. You yeah. know, you've, you've, you, you've damaged the computer. And unless you know the steps to take it back to a healthy state, it's always going to be damaged. And your brain is the same way, right? It's a computer. It's constantly upgrading. It's constantly learning. It's constantly evolving. And if someone comes along and punches you in the skull, you, woo, you know, like yeah. suddenly the, the, the computer chip took some damage. Yeah. And, um, and as we become a uh, more evolved species of people, we, we will start finding that. Um, and you can just go look at history. There's, you can draw straight lines. It's easy. Um, you start to realize and find that mental health is the cause of a lot of damage that we carry along with ourselves. And because of this, you have things that are, that represent or manifest as like quick fixes, right? So I'm going to start ragging on religion here. So just brace yourself. Um, you have things that come along like, you know, Christianity that say, that say things like, well, the voices that you hear are demons, so you have to pray to God because 
that will help cure these voices that you hear and you have to devote yourself to or devote yourself to being a religious person and um that's what help will cure you well no you're hearing these fucking voices because you literally have a mental health problem called schizophrenia mm. which manifests itself as um you know you can't control these these chemicals in your brain so mm-hmm. they're making these things go all over the place right. and you need some praying medical it away yeah exactly you need medical praying it away is not the answer um and then you have other things like Scientology that come along that go hold these metal rods let me see how many ghosts you have inside you what's well, fucking crazy yeah you know and we're talking about being crazy and to call something else crazy is also kind of a dirty word but in that instance Scientology is fucking nuts because <laughs> don't hold back all right fuck you um, fuck you Scientologist you're not even science um so you have these things that represent quick fixes that people go like, well, I pay a million dollars to Scientology every year and they tell me that my Thetan levels are going down. Well, dumb, dumb. You're not actually doing anything other than losing money. Yeah. You're, you're, you're not actually addressing what the problem is. You have that mental scar because you were raped as a nine-year-old because your fucking stepdad is a sick motherfucker. Yeah. And Scientology isn't going to fucking fix that emotional damage. They're going to lie to you and they're going to tell you that they did, but they, they didn't fix dick. They didn't do anything. So, yes, when you say that like it has to start with mental health and a focus on mental health, yeah, when is mainstream everybody going to buy into that? When are, when are people, you well, know? Well, that's the thing. I don't it's think even it's... even worse as men because we're not allowed to show emotion, remember? Sure. Well, I don't really live by that anymore, but I, I understand ever, that yeah. it exists. Um, the Okay, uh, tapping into the religious topic... <laughs> We're going we're to hate on cops. We're going to hate on religion. No, no, no. Well, and I think it's okay to have strong feelings. This is supposed to be feelings. a comedy podcast. We're talking about mental no, health problems. No, this is just a whatever. Uh, this is anybody <laughs> feels Sorry, the way they do. I was talking to Tony Soprano. I can't help it. This I, is whatever. I, my own voice gets real mundane, Some so I have to clown turn it into an accent. You. Yeah. Um, my own voice gets very... I do a lot of accents, too. The idea that religion is... Okay, I lived for a long time as a Catholic, real young, mm-hmm. as a kid, and then I started asking questions in school and Catholic, cl- you know, class. Well, ca- well, Catholic, well, what do you Michael, call that? It's called. Uh, well, depends on what the class it's, is. It's not communion class. It's uh, the pre-communion. Anyways, we, so we call my father. He he knows. <laughs> okay. Well, I started asking questions yeah. that they didn't like, and I got tossed out of that. And then, and that's what changed my life. Uh, religiously well I was always when I would ask those same questions it was always well you have to have faith sure right God will answer your questions for you just have to have faith Joshua you just have to pray it away yeah that didn't work for me either obviously yeah but for years it's not a real answer right and it put a real bad taste in my mouth for years in terms of at least the Catholic religion but then that wasn't a priest dick well maybe it was dark uh but what I'm saying is it did its thing I put a lot of distance between me and Catholicism, then even more distance between me and, and any sort of religious faith for a long time. And then I started just recently within the last five years, started understanding that I can have my own version and my own, uh, uh philosophy uh-huh. that is sort of religious and spiritual. I can take the Bible, read a story and make it make sense to me. And and it's between the well, lines. You just, unlo- you just unlocked re- fucking religion, is what you just did. Well, basically, because because I understand the power of a story, right? To begin with, yep. And what that story can mean to me. The healing part is when when what you believe makes your life better, and the lives around you benefit. That is the spiritual experience that you can take away from religion. And I think well, that you saying it's a spiritual experience differs greatly from it being a religious experience because right. i believe you can be spiritual i believe that you can well, i don't believe anything i can't I stay away from that word i have a really strong feeling <laughs> that you can be spiritual right like um take my um my mother for example she's a large percentage of native american and there's a lot of spirituality that comes out of her that seeped into our lives as children um dream catchers everywhere <laughs> just, just put them on the wall whatever look like spider webs who cares um you know but a lot of it too uh of just like 
getting what you need from the earth and the earth taking care of you. And, um, are we going to go into environmentalism? Who knows? Uh, but just having that spiritual connection with the planet. Yeah. And this is the woman that I would see when, when we weren't homeless, would go outside and water bushes and, and the ground and stuff and just stand there and talk to them. And I never understood it. And then when I asked about it, that's her spiritual connection, mm-hmm. you know, and um, something she learned from her people. And uh, my dad, who was Catholic, like you're talking about, grew, grew up that way, thought it was weird, <laughs> but right. loved my mom. So just was like, cool, well, you do you, boo. Yeah. And um, I think has, has now that they've been together for so many years, have has actually gone, has kind of gone away from the structure that Catholicism brings and has just embraced the parts about it that make sense to him. And I think when you, when you have hardliners in religion that go, well, this is what the Bible says and is written by God. So it must be true. No, (laughs) sorry, love. It's not written by God. Um, It was written by, if we want to talk Bible, let's talk Bible. Um, the version of the Bible that we have today is often the King James Bible. And the King James Bible was what Gutenberg printed on his press, right? It's what he got out to the masses. That version of the Bible is actually a condensed version where a, the, uh, what is it called? The, um, card, the college of Cardinals, um, voted on what was going to be inside of the book, what was going to pertain to the narrative that they needed to tell. <clears throat> Right. So if you're if Catholicism is all about mourning your religion, right, it's all about the mourning of of the death of Jesus and how he's not on the planet anymore. And and, um, he died for our sins and everything and being in a constant mourning state. Then you need to figure out what stories make sense of that narrative. So you pick those stories and you tell those stories I have been very fortunate in being able to go to a bunch of different churches in my life. Mm -hmm. Um, I've gone to, I think that's important for people to do. I do. I I agree. I think that perspective is, is I think necessary. I went to, um, I remember the first time I got to go to a synagogue. Um, it was like, it's like Sunday mass for Catholics, but like a little bit older. I don't know if that makes any sense, but like the general, like vibe of it was like real old world, like very like, um, just super structured. And like, um, we have to say things in this way because it's what what we were told, you know, like it's, it's, um, yeah, you have, you have that. And then I, I, you know, I went to a, I went to a church where they handled snakes and that shit was Un- you did go real it was wait wait when where why this was in modesto okay <laughs> it was why that makes it sense was, <laughs> <laughs> they do weird shit in modesto yeah it's fucking odd um it was in modesto and it was i don't remember the why i just remember i went um i was with it was a, a girl wasn't it it, everything i do is because of women um no <laughs> i they i i no, I was with, I was actually with my one of, a good friend of mine named Brian, and um, who was it? Oh, I can't, anyway, I remember going in, and it was an old converted like. Um, do you remember the portable uh, units that they would have at elementary schools? Yes, yes. So I was, had many classes in those. Right, so it was a it was a portable like that. Ooh, creepy. And um, it was really narrow though. <laughs> It almost was like a, I don't know. It was like, it was weird. It was really narrow. Like a shipping container? Kind of like a shipping container. Yeah. Okay. Had windows and stuff. It was really nice inside. But then they brought out this crate. This fucking just pulled up this crate. And the guy was like, he, and he's like, we're going to talk about how to say no to Jesus or how to say no to Satan. So, Could, say hold no on. To Jesus. so how old were you again? Or did you late, even... late teens? Okay. Had a driver's license, you know, be able to drive that yeah. around that age. Okay. Um, and he just pulled out a bunch of snakes. Now, for those then the uninitiated, th- these are not poisonous snakes. They're like gardener snakes and, you know, fucking. <laughs> all the gay snakes. All the gay snakes. <laughs> <laughs> 
I don't think you can say that. In polite society. I just did. Right. I don't care. <laughs> it's in the Let's can. go for it. It's funny. Um, <laughs> it, was, it wasn't like cobras. It wasn't like rattlers. It wasn't, you know, it was right. like all these there were gardeners. Right. And it nurses. was like Lenur snakes. It was all these like fucking, you know, the snakes. Rainbow like, snakes. Right. <laughs> I keep them around because they take care of my mice in my garden. You know, like it just, they were just really wimpy snakes. You yeah, know? yeah, 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 yeah. And he's just walking around going like, the power of Christ compels you. And he's yeah. yelling and stuff. And I'm sitting there going, this is wild. Had you heard about this? Yes, known yes. About I this? knew about snake handlers actually from my mother who, okay. um, her family is from Oklahoma. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Another Modesto type and, uh, place. Yeah. Um, and um, they would go to, uh, what are they called? I can't, they talk in tongues. They speak old Latin. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, um, yep. and it's talking tongues, but it's actually Latin, but whatever. Um, yeah. and, um, and they would handle snakes too. So I actually Word knew about this from, from my mother. And I remember, um, this was before YouTube and that kind of stuff. You would mm-hmm. just see these like Ripley's believe it or not on TV and be yeah. like, this guy talks to snakes. Yeah. And it was like, where did this come from? Right. Like he has his own religion. It's like, right. well, what is that? He talks to snakes. Tell me more. Okay. Find out at eight. All right. <laughs> and you had to wait. And you had to wait. No um, binge watching. Wait. But um, I fortunately had a mother who was really supportive of all the weird shit I wanted to watch. And cool. So we would watch that kind of stuff. And then when I found out that there was an actual religion here locally that I could go see where they did this, I was jumped at the opportunity. Mm-hmm. And it didn't, deny, it didn't, uh, you know, it, it, it paid off. It was like really weird and really kind of cool. Okay. So when you were there and the snakes came out, what? I started laughing. You were laughing. I like actually got a lot of dirty looks, so I started laughing, okay. because there's such an absurdity to it. Um, it's theater, man. You know, it's it's a performance. You you are what we talked about earlier about like feeling emotion and um and and trying to have that emotion make sense. Like these people who do this religious stuff. They just like fly off the handle. They're committed. They're com- yeah. They're not going to break character. Yeah. And they're going to be like, you know, the guys you see at the televangelists who like knock people out with their coats. You know, you can walk now. Yeah. Sorry, bro. <laughs> yeah. You know, that's a that's a that's a disease you have in your bones. And I'm you, so removed from that. Um, style but of but living. but that's but that's um, it's theater, and you have to like that's how you get the true believers to believe. So, I started laughing. I got a lot of dirty looks. I removed myself. I didn't see the end of the service. I removed myself because I was laughing so hard. Because, uh, like you said, like you pulled out all these snakes and they're gardener snakes. It's like, oh, these snakes There's aren't no even danger dangerous. In that. Yeah. yeah. So uh, this isn't even interesting anymore. It's just weird. Yeah. Yeah. But I could see someone saying that about coming to an improv and sketch show with a bunch of twenty-something-year-olds in it. Yeah, but at least that's meant to be crazy. Right. <laughs> Structured crazy. Yeah, that's um, supposed to be unpredictable. So, saw that. Um, I got to go to a couple black churches, you know, big hats, a lot of singing and dancing. And I've I think never they, been there. the, you know, the black community has it figured out when it comes to going to church. It's like, it doesn't have to be boring. It can be fun. It's just about connecting and it is. It's about that community. Yeah. It's about, um, I, could see I went to, <laughs> I got to go to church with a Filipino family. Um, oh my God, there's Catholic, there's Catholicism. Then there's Spanish Catholicism. And if you don't know the difference, it's quite glamorous. Spanish Catholicism is super shiny, but really boring. Yes. Yes. <laughs> it is. It's kind of like what the Bible. That's like the, like you get the Bible with the gold leaf on it. And yeah. Stuff, but yeah. it's like smells like it hasn't been dusted in forever. Yeah. It, yeah. Filipino Spanish Catholicism is its own strange experience. Yes. And it's, it really and, is. And, but it's it's interesting to have those perspectives. Um, and then I went to like straight up just like white Protestant fucking, you know, waspy yeah. church a yeah. bunch of times. That and, was my experience. And uh, waspy church is, you know, 300 people cram into a room. No one wants to sit next to each other, but they yeah. put up with it. They're yeah. super judgy. They're super arrogant. Yes. They're super just not nice people. And then they do their, you know. It's for show is what it seems like. Yep. It's for show. You show I'm here. Up. Don't I'm here. ask me any questions. I got to talk to Dave when we're done. I got to talk to my fucking boat, you know, like sing, sing a couple songs and we're done. Yep. And then we go home and I turn on the Packers game. You know, how, how now, at this point in your life, do you see yourself getting any value of ch- out of church? No, no. I mean, I mean, if it was the right church with sort of no. that black feel, nope. that community, no. No, because I would feel like a hypocrite. You would know? you? Why? Because I, I don't believe in any of it. 
I don't I think it's all for show. I think you it's don't all, believe in the sense circus of tricks. community or you don't believe. In oh, the, sorry. I, no, I believe in sense of community. I think that's important. Because what I, I don't believe in is is religion. I think it's I, sure. But what I think. OK, so my perspective and I'm open to church, but it has to be the right feel. I can't go to. Well, that's Catholic your church. And, that's your experience, though. You had right. this sense. You had this this thing that you had got to do as a child. Right. Yeah. And you got to meet all these people and saw these faces every week. It was, you know. Um, it's like when you take a kid out of the school that you, like, you have a kid and, and they go, you know, kindergarten through fourth grade. And then suddenly you have to move for a job opportunity. So now this kid has to go to another school. Yeah. You're not, for the parents, like, dude, I'm just moving. And you're not going to remember these people, blah, blah, blah. You're that's uprooting for that child. Right. So what you're trying to connect to is those roots. You want to get back to that feeling, that nostalgic feeling that you had. In a way, yes, but uh, the other side of it no, is... No, this is what you want. Let me dictate to you. Uh, all right, I give up. No, the the idea is that there. I think there's a lot of value in, in a community that would be faith-based. However, it's real sensitive. It's a real sensitive subject in my mind when I get around super religious people. When they start... Define that. Well, if, they're, if I'm in a conversation and somebody is using a lot of biblical stories to mm, mm. uh well you know when moses did this and when abraham was told sure that, yeah, but if I they don't stand those if they don't break it down for me as to why they believe that's important it's hard for me to just stay on the surface because sure, me sure. i'm open to stories about cain and abel and adam and eve i think that those are because those are some of the most metal stories you can talk they're, about they're they're so and then cain killed his brother right but i think there's some and value then fucked his wife you know what I mean? Like in the whole Sodom and Gomorrah thing. And they became thing. mud people. You know what I think is interesting? Is That's all that true, by the way. You can read that. It's 100% true. The, the Sodom true, and Gomorrah thing. true, but it's written down. When, the, when God decided that all these people are fucked up. He turns them to salt. And he's like, well, we're going to get rid of them and start over. To me, that's it's like the death penalty. You know, if there's people in society that are terrible and can't oh, seem to yeah, get their shit together, get rid of them. why is it a bad thing to... Well, I think the death penalty... Blech. If right. God makes it okay, why can't we? Well, I think, and that's that's a big that's I mean, welcome to Florida. I mean, that's a huge argument in in the southern states where the death penalty is still alive and kicking. You know, yeah. and um, eye for an eye. I mean, that's their argument. You know, it's like well, they killed somebody; they deserve to die. But are there is there for some people is there no redemption? No, I don't. I don't necessarily think that that's true. I think for okay, the we'll talk Ted Bundy because that was something I watched recently on yeah. Netflix was the Ted Bundy thing. With, um, with what's his face? Oh, Zach Efron. Yeah. No, no, I did watch that one. You watched the documentary. I watched the doc. Dude, I just, reenactments or whatever. That one sucked because there's no like gore in it. Well, that was the point. Yeah, you were but, supposed. Uh, it was. It was the perspective of his actual. The only woman he was with that he didn't kill. Right. Well, he was with two women, and then that people didn't three, suspect one it. Got away. Well, yeah. Other than his wife, he thought he was. <laughs> she turned him in. Um, right. Uh, anyway, so let's take someone like Ted Bundy, right? Uh -huh. Ted Bundy is, um, he is a special case because you actually, there's actual footage of him showing who he is to people and him actually thinking he's smarter than everyone else and, and saying things that are just, well, I have no faith in my counsel and da, 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 and I can be a better lawyer and all this stuff. And I, you know, want a mistrial based on this and da, 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 da. And it's. Yeah, I mean, it's on display. His ego maniacalism is just on display, and you watch and you go, like, fascinating. <laughs> like, I'm watching this person's yeah. complete different, you know, a, a, a makeup of how his brain chemistry works on display. And it's a fascinating thing. Isn't to it watch. crazy, though? Like, you can't possibly connect to that mindset because you don't oh, think I that think way. I think it's far easier for people to connect to that mindset than they realize. Well, you think like, about it. It's 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 narcissism while at the same time, um, what's the word I'm looking for? It's a complete lack of empathy. It's a complete lack of. Uh, that's what I mean. I can't disconnect from that thought process. I can't not have empathy for people or compassion. I just I haven't been able to. That's fair. That's I. I for me, Ted Bundy is a really cool character study in. Um, what there's two parts of Ted Bundy that I find very interesting. There's Ted Bundy. <laughs> it's very interesting. Just go study that. And then there's how people reacted to him. Right. Mm -hmm. So when he was finally caught and 
all of these things. I mean, they're still figuring out shit that he did. Yeah. Believe it or not, which is he's been dead and buried since the 80s. He did a lot of bad stuff. He did a lot of bad. He traveled a lot, too. There's stuff that they're finding in state that right. they didn't know he was in. Right. That then they go and they get witness statements. and like, fuck, that was Ted Bundy. And then the murders match up, and it's a whole thing. But um, uh, there's how society reacted to him, right? So you had two people. You had this bloodthirsty eye for an eye. He needs to die because he was killing all of these innocent women, which is... By the way, society, make up your fucking mind. <laughs> either what do you mean? Either women are equal or they're not, right? Like, yeah, but those ones he killed were bitches, bro. No, <laughs> they were fucking that's, horrible people. That's, I know. That's not what I mean. Oh, what okay. I, what, it's hilarious, but not what I, what I mean is, is like <laughs> when something happens to uh, females, when it's like Ted Bundy, suddenly everybody is like, we got to protect women and we have to make sure that they're sought after and blah, 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 and all this stuff. And they're, you know, they're the weaker species of, of what we are and they can't defend themselves. Aren't they? And no. Oh, okay. Oh my God. No. <laughs> have you pushed a baby <laughs> out, bro? <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> Just kidding. By the way, that is not a real opinion. I, everybody, there are wonderful. MMA fighters that will stop that will your kick face. My ass. That'll, I will surrender. I mean, um, no, I think I think it's I think it's completely unfair to have that viewpoint, right? Mm-hmm. But then on the opposite side of that viewpoint of like we have to protect these women and blah blah blah, you have people going like, well, they brought it on themselves, and it's just a really fucked up thing. But anyway, what I mean by the societal reaction to Ted Bundy is, you had he's an animal, he needs to be put down, he's a rabid dog, blah blah blah. But then you had people who were in love with him, who yeah. oh, you know, but I think and he's I'm, sexy. And I, yeah, exactly. And I'm not trying to pick on women here, but they were mostly women that were like. Oh, he just didn't. He just doesn't have the right lady in his life, and I can fix him and all this stuff. And okay, you you can't. It, he's broken on a level that is unfixable, as far as we're concerned now, and 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 in present society, we don't know how to fix that kind of stuff yet. There's not an amount of pills. That Do you makes, think his his existence is a necessary evil, and others like him? Well, that's philosophy talking. Yeah, um, yeah, I'm curious though, it's, because at some is point, it a, is it a necessary evil? Mm-hmm. No, I don't think that any evil is necessary. I think that um, that's an antiquated and religious viewpoint to call something evil. Um, I think that it's. Um, I think that there is wrong and not wrong, and I think to kill somebody is wrong. So, do you think that him and others like him? Uh, psychopaths let's let's put it that way are uh just a part of reality obviously they are yes but i mean there's no real stopping it at the end of the day we're all primates have you ever seen the um documentary about the fbi agent who started um what uh okay so if you go back and watch silence of the lambs clary starling is a profiler and when she's doing it in that time it's still new it's brand new in the 1960s this fbi he's a young super young fbi guy starts noticing that there's a pattern it's that one show what is it called manhunter manhunter i've been waiting for the new episodes (laughs) i don't know if they're coming uh i don't know either but that's based on a real guy it's based on a very real person right and um yeah he starts noticing this pattern and it's uh, so he goes through and he's interviewing all the ones that they've captured and everything. And then, and they're, that's how they start to develop a profile for serial killers. Right. So it's an interesting science and it all goes it, like there's, you know, Ed Gein is one of the very first ones that we ever learned about. Ed Gein killed his mom, skinned her, wore her, killed other people in her mom, yeah, in his yeah, mom's yeah. skin. Yeah. That's you know, really that was in up Wisconsin. <laughs> but he's all like super nice and super nice. Yeah. Yeah. Super nice. So when you look at him and how he presents himself, he doesn't see it as What's the word? What's the word where unnormal, you know? Is it or, it's not know. narcissist. What's the word? It's um you can't you can't be empathetic but you can feign that and people believe it. I don't know. If it's it narcissism means. then then I think it's a relative of that word. Okay, but anyway, it's, it's I, related for whatever to... reason that's stuck in my craw. But um, but that whatever that's called, that's that's what a lot of these guys have in common is that they can't. No empathy. They have no empathy, yeah. and so therefore they're unable. It's to... It's like an autism kind of thing, right? It's that I 
ten to one. I bet you it's on the spectrum. It probably. Is. Um, but they have a. I'm they, scared of autistic people. Really? No. Oh. <laughs> I just thought that was a good time to say it. Jesus Christ. I was like real concerned for <laughs> yeah, you. Yeah, don't get close to those freaks. <laughs> Counting sticks on the ground. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How many hey, sticks? How hey, many matches Rain are Man, in there? Back yeah. off, Rain Man. What about kids? Are you going to have kids? Is no. that a thing? No, it's not a thing. No? No. It's not for us, man. I mean, like, sure. my wife and I, you know, we live a certain type of lifestyle and we don't. Yeah. We don't, I don't have, you know, I mean, for years I was always like, kids are gross. I was like Dr. Grant from Jurassic Park. I was like, kids smell, they're fucking noisy. <laughs> you know, I want, just want to dig my bones in the desert. Leave me alone. Yeah. You know, like uh, uh, now I've had friends who, you know, you had a child. Um, I probably, did. Yeah, it's weird. I there's, remember that. There's a tiny version of you running around. He's pretty cool. Um, you know, other friends of us, of ours, um, have had ch- children. My family, my sister has two boys. They're grown. You know, they're both like fucking one just turned yes 14. i've seen pictures and he's like six two i uh, and I don't, I don't mean to put people on blast what i think is interesting about your sister and what i know of her through facebook is she's a, a non-bully you she's have a, a one view of her and yes it's only through right right and that's what i'm getting so at. interesting this is all like just whimsical but yes anti-bullying 100 percent. uh she she's an anti-bully advocate yep Big but a hundred percent big. I've been on the news, but a hundred percent a police supporter. Right, and uh, okay, which is the biggest bully of all. <laughs> so, so, but what's interesting is that your mom or your mom, your sister is anti-bully advocate. Posts a lot about that. What's interesting is that that sort of, in in my view, sort of paints a target on her boys. Boy, are you? Are you? <sighs> Boy, did you hit the target in the center? Um, yeah, it, which is which is it's hard to watch it because it's like uh, you I, should I'm ask her. You it. should ask her about that because that is a hundred percent a situation that yeah. happened. I mean, it it sucks, right? Like you hear you have uh, my nephews are they're not perfect. Um, they're hilarious, but they're not perfect. Nobody is, um, you know. And um, except for my my woman, <laughs> she's yeah. My wife perfect. is a saint. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Uh, it's, it, it, they're, they're awesome. You know, they're, they're super athletic. They're incredibly intelligent. Um, you know, my sister and, and my brother-in-law did a great job in raising them. are still continuing to do a great job in raising them. Um, and, uh, you know, have done, have very much put them that, you know, have very put very much put their children before themselves Yeah. in a lot of ways. And, um, this bullying thing that my sister undertook, and underwent is, is 100% a thing that I was, I am super supportive of. Of course. Any, um, anybody should be. Eh, nope. <laughs> no, <laughs> no. Um, I I, there I, are I there so. for as many people as support her in this. There is just as many that think that she is overstepping her boundaries and that she don't, it's just a blanket. Fuck it. Um, I don't want to look at that part of the couch. Uh, it's gross, right? It's like this weird <laughs> mocha brown. We got this couch for free and it's awesome. Oh, uh, it's wonderful. It's super soft, but it's like, it's a gross. Color. No, it's just, it's like falling and I feel yeah. obligated to yeah. stop it from happening. Hello. And my chihuahua's here now. Um, and, uh, yeah, I mean, she had mothers coming after her saying that like, she's overstepping her boundaries and she needs to, you know, well, you just need to tell your two boys to sack up and just deal with it. Yeah. And for a long while, there was a part of me that was like, it was 50, 50 on it. Right. There was like, I was bullied in high school and I was bullied in elementary and I was homeless in junior high. You think I wasn't bullied? Yeah. yeah. I just beat the shit out of them. Shut them up. Sure. But what did that do? They get, got me expelled from school. I was, I was viewed as a problem. I was viewed as a nuisance. I was viewed as somebody that needed to be getting rid of. So, do I think that bullying is essential? No. Do I think it happens? Yes. Do I think it's exclusive to schools? Hell no. Yeah. You know, I work at a retail store that's a, one top 25 retail stores in America. And there is a there is a lot of bullying from top down. I mean, it just happens. Not everybody's guilty of it. No. I have a lot of really wonderful bosses who really look after me and really want what's best for me but like i said for everyone that's supportive there's an equal amount of people who want to push you down into the mud well we're all kids we never actually grow up we no, we just adapt we adapt we try to be adults but the truth is we we need yeah. we need to either be parented or parent ourselves 
And, and that goes cases, back to your thing about community. It takes yes. a village, you know, like yes. that's a very true statement. It takes a village. And that's what my sister was trying to do. Yeah. Yeah. Say it's hey, not easy being that it's, Hey, voice. you know, this is, you, they had to move schools for, for it. There yeah. was, I mean, not so, not only does she speak up and say like, this needs to stop. This is a problem. Yada, yada, yada. But then because she did that, it continued and they had to move schools. Yeah. And, um, and so, no, I commend my sister. I think she's a very good thing that she's doing. Um, she has my support 100%. Um, but, but her kids aren't just the victims. I and mean, I've seen them bully each other. You know? <laughs> Do you know what I mean? It's a boy thing for sure. I agree. And here's a confession. I think it's a hormonal thing. Well, here's I a confession. I don't think it's gender specific. I, I have been in the pants of a, bu- not like in a bully's pants, but in my own pants. And I was a bully. I have been a bully We've in all some instances in my yeah. life. Even my sister, she won't admit it. You know, she's like, I never did that. She, she, please. I'm, <laughs> you were a mean girl at one point in high school. You were a bully. Don't hormones, fuck. you're right. It it's is, hormones. It, it is has nothing hormonal... to do with gender. It has nothing to do with upbringing. It's a hormonal It's a thing. rites of passage, I think. And, I, and, and that sucks. It goes, like, like, like it goes back to like hazing a little bit where, yeah, there's a um, – we've, we've all done it, right? But I think where – my sister will vary from other people is that she will admit to you that she's not innocent in this. And that's part of the reason why she has that perspective is because she knows, sure. you know, she needs to be leading by an example. Yeah. Um, but I commend her totally yeah. on taking that huge supporter of police though. and being, a, well, she is the police. She is in a way. She is the police. She's the white lady police. Yeah. And I, I commend her for that. And I, I was just always wondering, She's you know, such a white lady that she has like wine glasses that say like, you know, like it's Tuesday. So fill my wine glass <laughs> here. It's Friday. So fill it all the way. That here. is such a white it's lady. It's such a white lady. I love you to death, sis, but it's such a white lady. Wine thing. apparel. Wine I drink apparel. wine. I'm yeah, she's mother. got like wine T-shirts yeah. and like you know. But I mean, but that's her jam, dude. Like, I'm not shitting that's on. Cool, man. I like it. It's I funny to me, it. you know. But it's like, attractive to it's, someone. It's, yeah, it's you. You live your best life. I'm not here to judge. <laughs> I love your sister. She's always been a too. bright light. Every I don't time, always agree with her, but I love her to Yeah, and no, every time she's walked into a room, she's full of love to give. I think and, you're one of the few people who've actually got to party with her. Oh yeah, I think you were at some of the parties where she was tequila yeah. wasted. Yeah. yeah, back in the day. <laughs> back back in the day. Back in the day. Back in the day when we used didn't to have roam the, the streets yeah. of Sacktown. We didn't have cars, so we walked everywhere. Yeah, no, we, there was no Uber. Ro- roving. There was of, look. You go, you have a couple of drinks and try to sober up before you drive right. back home. You know what I mean? Or you call a cab like a civilized human and you pick your car up the next day, ashamed and embarrassed with parking tickets. And you know what? You had a story to tell. Or you find a loser friend, take them with you so you can Or you drive walk back. your ass. I can tell you a hundred stories of growing up in my 20s in downtown Sacramento. And every single one of them will end in a drunken escapade to the 24-hour Safeway. <laughs> Yeah, that sounds about right. I remember living right next to that Safeway, and I would constantly see people I knew. I oh love that. Yeah. I'd yeah. go in my PJs, and I'd yeah. see people. What's interesting now is you go, maybe it was the same before, but I've only noticed recently that if you go at a certain time in the evening, everyone's eyes are bloodshot. Every single so person. we're all high there. as shit trying to cope with yes. the day. Everybody is, everybody's high. Yeah. So, and then, okay, to touch on that a little bit, uh, I'm a, a commercial driver. Mm-hmm. The federal government believes that I cannot have marijuana in my system. However, it's it's okay for me to go out and get plastered (laughs) drunk, institutionalism, sober up and go to work, which is just a weird thing. As somebody who uses your logic brain, right? Yeah. That is a weird thing to say. It's like, oh, I can go out the night before and get fucking shit canned. Yeah. Like get so drunk. I'm, I'm still drunk when I wake up and I'm throwing up. But it's 100% acceptable for that behavior. But taking two or three puffs before I go to bed of marijuana is considered uh, some sort of like tantamount to like shooting up heroin and eating babies. Yeah, like, pretty much. I like, mean, the, how those things compute, that's man. That's the sort of nostalgic value they, they've put on it. But it all goes back to William Randolph Hearst and his, and his war on hemp. So, yeah, um, it, that's where a lot of this legislation and stuff for, about marijuana comes from is uh, William Randolph Hearst and his war on it um, so that he didn't. Oh, to... I remember this story now because I watched some sort of Netflix documentary about this and it was the jazz culture that brought it into. Cold brew. Oh, that's what that was. 
Yeah, it's cold brew coffee. That's a very popular thing. Mm-hmm. I've hadn't had it in a long time, which is why I'm like, Bleh! but I knew you were coming over today, so I wanted. I had to... a red drink. <laughs> it was a real rock quick star. to not say its name. I was going to say Red Bull, but I had a red it's, it's energetic <laughs> beverage. <laughs> I had blood. Yeah, blood. <laughs> I had, yeah. true, I had that true blood from that HBO show. Yeah. No, I had a, I had a rock star. I'm a, I'm, I'm an addict. First time. My name is Mike you. Haley. I'm an addict. Um, it works if you work it. It's been many different things. Uh, it's been alcohol before. It's been weed. It's been. Mm. It's, My constant is food. My constant addiction is food. Oh, mine is m- most definitely food, and sugar, salt, caffeine. Those are my three. My three worst enemies. Yeah. My best, closest friends. And what's weird is I've tried to cut them off before, and you know what that's like? That's like not hanging out with your best friend anymore. Oh, my God. And you, it's like it's like they call you, and you can't answer the phone. Mm-hmm. Or they text you, and you can't text them back. That's yep. what it feels like. Yeah. It's I mean, so you're not weird. wrong. Um, so, you know, going back to what we were talking about before with the weed thing um, and your truck driving stuff, uh, it's, it's, it's odd that those things you can't. You can you can literally be hung over and still partially drunk and then get in the cab and drive somewhere. But if you had had a couple of puffs and you and three months ago and you pop positive and it's like, well, you're a degenerate. Get the fuck out of here. Yeah. You know? um, so, yeah, there's various varying degrees of like what the law is. And it's really weird. Like I um, you saw the thing on Nevada, not able. They're not legally able to test people. They're trying to. I thought it was like a real. No. Thing. So like right now. Well understand that legalization of marijuana is state level right and the way the federal government and i'm dumbing this down so anybody listening going like this yeah thanks josh has not said one detail in fact i'm just summarizing stuff just so i'm not nerding it up okay yeah the nerd is not a dirty word unless you want it to be um so there's a everything's on state level and what the federal government is supposed to do is go oh this is what the states want. Okay, let's let's ratify what we need to ratify and make it federal, right? Mm-hmm. But then sometimes it goes, this is federal law and all the states need to fall in line. So what you right now is you have this battle of like more states than not have legalized marijuana marijuana in a medical... I almost said marijuanica. Like, what is that? I like that word. I do too, but I don't That's know what... That's a great marijuanica. marijuanica. <laughs> it sounds like a tropic drink, right? That's, yeah, I'll put that in part of the description of this marijuana. We talk about police, racism, and marijuana. Um, so <laughs> hold on, I have to scold my chihuahua. No, go lay down on your blanket. Go, lay down. Go, please and thank you. That way. What a defiant child! Eighteen-year-old chihuahua who just. It's never not got out of being a puppy. You should put it down. <laughs> Jesus Christ. <laughs> well, let's hope he's there waiting for her. <clears throat> we have 67 Facebook friends in common. Did you know that? Well, I didn't even know I knew 67 people. Isn't that weird? Yeah. We're we're linked, we're linked by at least 67 degrees. Of Kevin Bacon? Of Kevin Bacon. <clears throat> That's weird to know that we both have that... Um, Large of a circle? Yeah, that's that's weird. Like, I know Facebook numbers are often, like, sort of, like, uh, trumped up because, you know, it's, you just say yes to everybody. But, um, I, God, I can't even, like... I don't. I don't say yes to everybody. Well, I mean, neither do I. On Facebook. <laughs> Some people, I'm feel, like, what are you trying to get out of this? Way to make Fuck me feel off. like an asshole. <laughs> well, no, but... Say yes to everybody. Mila, settle down. I know. You see that over there? <laughs> Lose your fucking mind. Uh, oh, it's terrible. Oh girl. my god, so my, terrible. My neighbors are talking. She's a super wine white lady too. Is she? My neighbor, yeah. What Her. is it with wine and white ladies? I, you know, I, I, what's it with guys who play golf in white pants? I just think they're connected. <laughs> if we took those sixty-seven people and we put them in the same room at the same time, how many of them could remember why and how we're friends? I don't know. I I feel like I've done a fairly okay job at allowing the right people into my social media mm. membership. <laughs> <laughs> I'm get, a member of Mike Haley. We get fucking t-shirts in this. <laughs> I like this club. I'm a huge fan of Mike Haley. Yeah. I, I'm on his Facebook. <laughs> but I think, you know. Saw him at a show. 
followed him. Well, what's interesting is that social media is going to be my way of getting people on the podcast. Is well, I yeah, I mean, because it's a tool, it's a tool that you're going to use. Yeah. But I just mean like how like I'm excited. How weird is it though? You know, like I just think it's weird. I I think there is a weirdness to it as well. I I Why think do it's I strange sound that... different. I'm sorry. I don't know what it is. You sound great. I sound like I'm in a can. Oh, I bet it's these headphones. Try these. Hey guys, sorry to interrupt. Um, I just wanted to give you a heads up. The next story that Josh is going to get into is about a time him and I were at a performance. Uh, we were in a comedy troupe together called iCup Comedy Troupe, I-C-U-P. We put sketches together. Uh, we rehearsed twice a week. Uh, this was something I did for about a year, but Josh had been doing this for much longer than that. Uh, he founded this group along with a couple other close friends, and I came along a little bit later. However, this story is about a fight with a biker gang that erupted after the show, and I caught some tail end of it, in which I thought the whole thing was funny. But after listening to the story, it was quite dramatic and extremely dangerous. The dude, the oh. Clarion was the biker incident. Oh my god, what a what a funny! You were the only one that was show. laughing at that. I was the only one laughing. The only one. <laughs> it was unreal. It was Sons of Anarchy yeah, in my face. I, I, yeah, I was there. I unreal, was, man. Um, it blew me away. I was like, "Is this really how we're here performing in a hotel, a sketch comedy show, and there's literally a biker threatening to kill someone?" Like, I mean, to be fair, I fucked him up first. <laughs> what do you mean? Um, so we're doing the show, and um, I remember the I remember being on stage and even saying to you guys, like, "Well, the crowd's really raucous." You know, the crowd's like really fucking into this tonight. Yeah. You know, little did we know that there was a like a legitimate biker gang in the bar that was um, they were on a ride and they were doing their thing and they had come to this bar. Because they were using the hotel as like a, as it was a, a, it was basically, they were pimping out girls and using the hotel as a front. And you sure about that? Positive. Okay. Because they were also running drugs out of it. I'll take, well, I believe it. The way he was talking, I'm not, I don't doubt it. Um, he obviously thought, he kept saying, I'm a soldier. I'm a soldier. I got, I got my own soldiers and shit like that. You were there for the height of it. You weren't there for the aftermath where they were trying to get me by myself to deal with me by getting me drunk. And I had, and I knew what game they were playing. Anyway, hold on. We're just just jumping ahead. Sure. Yeah. Go ahead. Um, so coming off the, I know I'm trying, that's why I'm trying to hold it. (laughs) Go ahead and fix it. It's all right. This is a live performance and, uh, I don't want you to Owen Hart this shit. Whoa. Whoa. why yo Anyways, what were we talking about? The biker incident. Biker incident. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Go back to that. Um, we do the show. I remember the show being really raucous. Not nothing that I'm not used to. Mm-hmm. Uh, TFO really kind of adapted me to that crowd. And, um, oh, Jesus. So, um. At the end of the show, my mom and my dad would come to most of my shows. They would come to the majority of the shows. And um, the, my mom comes walking up and she's fucking crying. She's like in tears. And I was like, what's going on? And she's like, nothing. Don't worry about it. Everything's fine. We're going to go. You know, I'm sorry. It's not a big deal. And I was like, nope. Nobody makes my mom cry. What the fuck is going on right now? And that is when my older brother, Greg, comes up to me and and says, you know, like, hey, whatever happens, I'm here. And I was like, huh? Like, so I have no idea what's going on at this point. All I know is, is my mom is in tears and my brother's telling me he's ride or die. So I was like, okay. So she proceeds to very, you know, tearfully tell me that there was a guy at the bar who she went to go close their tab. And this guy at the bar was making fun of her. And my father at the time who was there it was in this was when he his leg started to deteriorate so he was in, he had a cane and he couldn't do much and um uh so this guy was like poking in front of my mom and made my mom cry so i asked her to point him out she pointed him out i didn't introduce myself i didn't go up to him and say hey man you know like i get it you're drinking you're kind of you know there's much better ways to handle the situation i just checked him into a wall i mean i just put everything I had into him and he was taller and bigger than me. And, um, 
I put everything I had into him and put him against the wall and it was on. It was me, uh, my two brothers, Jawara. I think you were in the mix at one point because you were just trying to stop stuff from happening. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't even. And um, (laughs) little did I know that these people were (laughs) dangerous. I just knew that there was somebody... Somebody that was making that made my mom cry, and that guy was gonna fucking. And this was, I'm I'm not kidding when I say this was maybe five minutes after a hilarious show ended. Yeah. You know, a very good <clears throat> show. This was the first time that we had done the stick your head and what the fuck was that game called? You hold your breath and almost die improv game. You know. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, we we just we found out in that moment that these were very serious people. They had guns on us uh, in a hallway. You know, you had Randy the barkeep keeping the peace saying like, Oh God, you don't want this. Don't snake. Don't do this. Oh my God. The guy's name was snake. And, uh, HBO. So, so yeah, we get out in the lobby at that point. Skylar wanted to go. Skylar wanted to get the fuck out of there. I didn't blame him, you know, but a bunch of motorcycles go by at one point. Those are all my soldiers. These guys are da, 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 da. You know, it's kind of stuff. And, um, Jackass. Yeah, just really just fucking. It's just weird, man. Yeah, it's very weird. And um, yeah, I mean, it was a dumb move on my part. And I get it, though. I mean, you're, it's your mom. It's just how it. Yeah. You're just you're sensitive. Some I remember at some point I was in a bar situation. My mom was there and she was sitting with these two two older white guys and they were giggling amongst each other. And I just felt like they were poking fun at my mom mm-hmm. without her knowing. Yeah. And she's this naive Filipino lady who's, you know, still has a really thick accent. I thought, I felt these guys were being dicks, you know? Yeah, yeah. And I was in my early 20s and I just walked up. I'm like, you guys aren't making fun of my mom, are you? And they were just like, uh, what? <laughs> and I was like, oh, I'm just making sure, you know, because it looks that way to me. And I'm thinking back, I'm like, oh my God, come You're on. You're just some, yeah, I mean, like now that I'm, I'm 34 years old. It was a bouncer for many years and like, you know, the optics on it were so bad. You know, the perception of that was so bad. I went into that re- next rehearsal. I had talked to Jawara the night before that rehearsal, the next rehearsal after the show. I had spoken to, I'd spoken to you privately about that. Um, I'd spoken, I pretty much touched up with everybody who was there um, or kept in touch with everyone who was there and apologizing and had said, and pretty much ended every conversation saying like, we're going to talk about it in rehearsal. And if you guys decide that I don't need to be in the troop anymore, I will leave. And I remember everybody on the phone was like, no, nah, I don't think it'll come to that. So dramatic. Yeah. I don't, you know, it'll be, it was, you know, you're just like, that shit was hilarious, you know, like, <laughs> and, um, so I think, yeah. you know, there, but I did, I went in, I went into that rehearsal the next day and I, I remember the, the, the tone of that, that, and uh, I said, hour. I, and I said, you know, if this is, something that you guys feel like you're in danger if I'm at a show or anything like that, then you, oh, Lord. You please tell me and I'll leave. You know, I don't, yeah. the show is more important than me. And everybody was just like, nah. I never saw it like that. I honestly missed it. I missed the guns. I missed most of all the altercations. I just remember some yelling, this soldier word being thrown around. I'm, you know, I'll get them right now or some shit. And then you guys were like, no, 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 listen, let's calm down. Let's start this thing over, whatever. Well, it yeah, that was, that was Randy, Randy and, um, Skylar really were like, no, you need to listen. Like, and Randy even like, you know, was saying to the guys like, no, you made fun of his mom. Like you made his mom cry. Like that's, and they, and I think when snake heard that, cause snake turned around and that's his VP, you mm-hmm. know? As his vice president, Snake turned around, slapped that fool in the face, and was like, "He was like, you made a fucking, you know, what the fuck are you thinking? Get the fuck, give me, give me your colors, give me your colors." And he took his fucking coat from him, sent him on timeout. I never <laughs> in my life seen a grown ass man uh, put another grown ass man on timeout. I yeah. never seen that. And then that, you know, but the optics, I disrespected that that gang. I walked in. Sure, yeah, you. Put I walked into in a, a lion's den and slapped a lion in the face and dared him to do something. Yeah. You know, and I didn't know yeah. why, because you made my mom cry. Yeah. Well, I mean, obviously Snake <laughs> understood the uh, level of emotion that came out of you. to take down the world. Obviously. Snake. What, a, what a weird, interesting situation that turned out to be a very interesting story. Well, and then months later, we were still working there and Sabrina's last show is coming up. It's uh, October 16th 
and I get a phone call at 4.30 in the morning. Hey, I just want to, it's Randy. Hey, I just want to let you know, ABC's coming by today. They're going to check out the venue. Um, you know, w- we should be fine, but if anything happens, we're just letting you know. And I'm thinking, like, what the fuck? Why would anything happen? Like, well, ABC had been there multiple nights in a row. ABC had been there staking out the joint. ABC and the Sacramento police knew what this biker gang was doing, and they were just, oh, wow. they were just collecting data. Yeah, yeah. Um, they were using, that's how I know about this stuff. Okay. Cool. So not only, super cool, not only were they <laughs> using the hotel as like, um, a prostitution, yeah. uh, like center, yeah. they were also running drugs out of the bar and they were, um, acquiring liquor illegally and selling liquor illegally. He defaulted on his liquor license a couple of times and was given prov- provisionary liquor license um, it was like, well, you have the restaurant, so we can give you a provisional for like beer and wine. And he just was still serving cocktails and stuff. Not to mention there was underage drinking going on there too. So, but yeah, so he calls me at eight something in the morning and was like, I don't have a venue anymore. There's, they've barred the doors. I, every time I called him, I got nothing back. So the first thing I do is I call everybody in the troop. I'm like, hey, the you know, show's canceled. All right. Well, anyways, Josh, thank you so much. Of course. I loved I loved every minute of this. I loved catching up with you and hearing that you don't actually hate cops. I just, I, you know, I got to be honest. No, I, I thought, do. I, I do. <laughs> I do hate cops. I think you hate some of the things that that cops represent currently. But the idea of policing the world is important to you. No, I don't. I don't. Um, well, policing the community, rather. No, again, you have it wrong. I do? <laughs> yes. Okay. I, I think that there is a problem in our police force where we use the word force, and I think that we need to be um, uh, in a place where we don't fear the police, but we embrace the police. And, and right I agree. now we fear the police. When we, like I said earlier, like when I you, can agree with that. When you have, when you see a cop roll into your neighborhood, it's not like, oh, hey, Dale's coming. Yeah, let's go say hi to Dale. It's oh fuck, someone's right. getting took to the fucking clinker today. Well, you know, and it's just it sucks. The and media it, has has a way with the view. Oh, don't get me started on that. Well, I'm just saying, I think it's important that that th- times like this and conversations we had are, uh, uh, just important, really. For lack of a better... I agree, man. And I also think that you have to be able to listen to perspectives of stuff. There was a commenter on my post that said, like, you know, you should be careful with what you say because it's dangerous. That's what was told to you? And that's what... That was what was... It was I'm, I'm, I'm quoting, like, three words yeah. in a paragraph. Okay. Um, and I... And I... That particular sentence sticks out to me because... <sighs> Jesus Christ, I have to be careful what I say because it's dangerous. But the cops don't have to be careful with what they do or what they say or how they present themselves. Like It's more dangerous to me to not voice your opinion and to not be heard than it is to just shut up and take it. You know what I mean? Like it's it's yeah. to just shut up and take it is such a flawed philosophy because you don't. I mean, you, you, imagine I came to you. And I said, hey, Mike Haley, I, you have this beautiful woman that you want to marry. You have, it's working. It's all, it's all, it's all figured out. But just so you know, like the first week you guys were dating, she was dating like three other dudes too. Shut up and take it. I'm going to have to analyze that a little <laughs> bit more later on. But I get what you're saying. I appreciate your honesty. And I'm going to analyze that. And uh, yeah, <laughs> I, I do. I appreciate your honesty and you being open and talking about it. I think that's the most important part here. And I'm an open book, man. Ask me to go to any chapter and I'll skip there for you. It's, it's easy. Okay, good. Well, then well, let's talk about the firings. I'm going to end the podcast so I can hear about it. <laughs> Thanks for cho- tuning in and, and listening to us and sending us the love. And I'm not going to talk about the firings. Well, I'm going to shut it off right now. I'm still Possibly. Not talk about it. In theory. Goodbye. Well, everyone I ever meet goes here in this book, and now I met you, and you're going in the book. I'm just a wandering nomad out on the interstate. Eventually, all these roads just end up looking the same. I'm just a
check mic one two one two mic check one two one two check mic one two one two mic check one two one two Mike Haley in the mix. Biatch!